Welcome to the Humans Outside Podcast, where we are building a life around getting outdoors through learning from fascinating outside-minded guests. I'm Amy Bouchotz, a journalist originally from the beach in California, now working to love nature from my home in Alaska. Since September 2017, I've spent at least 20 consecutive minutes outside every single day, no matter the weather. On this show, we hear from others who make heading into nature just a part of who they are while we work to do the same. If you love what we do, you can support Humans Outside on Patreon or leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Ready for the good stuff? Let's go. Most of us know this without anyone saying it, even if we'd rather not admit it. We spend way too much time in front of screens. And no matter how much or little time you spend on the computer with your phone or watching TV, or eh, if you're like me, sometimes all three at the same time, you might still feel like it's too much. After all, the whole point of Humans Outside is helping us build an outdoor habit and getting us outside for a measly 20 minutes a day. That 20 minutes seems like it should be easy to do, but sometimes it's hard because you just can't peel yourself away from your devices and life. In short, you want to figure out a way to unplug, but you feel like you can't. Today's guests, Sebastian Sloven and Sonia Muhammad, probably hear this complaint a lot, and it's why they started Nature Unplugged, a company based in warm and beautiful San Diego designed to help people like you and me figure out a way to set down our devices and build a habit and lifestyle around unplugging. And while they often work specifically with youth, their advice and insight is great for people of all ages. Today, they're going to take us to unplugging school. Sebastian and Sonia, welcome to the Humans Outside podcast. Thanks. We're happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're psyched. Okay, so we like to start our podcasts imagining ourselves in our guest's favorite outdoor space. So we're sitting in front of screens right now to have this conversation, but let's just pretend that we're not doing that. Uh, if we were going to join you somewhere outside, where would we be with you today? Ooh, this is a tr- this is a, a tricky question, but I'm going to go with uh, maybe it's something a little bit different than you've experienced before. But we're going to be surfing. Actually, oh. we're going to be at one of my favorite surf spots. We live in North County, San Diego, in Encinitas. There's a spot called Swami's, which is a beautiful point of land, and we're going to be out in the water on our boards. You know, this is in between when the waves are coming. And we're just hanging out, having a conversation. Love uh, it. Yeah. Full disclosure, I'm not a surfer, so I'll mostly just be floating on the board. <laughs> and I, though I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, shamefully, I'm not a surfer either. I will float with you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I'll um, be slightly distracted with like keeping an eye out for waves, but I'm pretty engaged in the conversation. Cool. Awesome. And better yet, it is pretty much impossible to have a screen with you <laughs> when you are surfing or hanging out in the water. Good tip. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So tell us, uh, Sonia, if you don't mind telling us first, how did you become a person who likes to go outside? Sure. So I spent a lot of time outside when I was young, as I think most of us did. And it wasn't really until I got older and became an indoor creature, if you will, like in a nine to five job, that I realized that I'd totally gotten out of balance and the importance and beauty of being outside just for my physical and emotional well-being. And so I think it was maybe like 10 years ago, I was just sort of sitting in an office, you know, realized I hadn't gone outside for maybe 10 hours straight and was like, whoa, I need to really work on this and started to find ways to get outside during my work day. And then eventually um, found my way to a job that lets me be outside much more. Awesome. What about you, Sebastian? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think for me, it goes back to the beach. I grew up in a you know, coastal town of San Diego called La Jolla. And my dad was this really great ocean swimmer. And, uh, you know, a lot of my early memories are mixing it up on the beach and in the water with my dad. And that was my, I guess, um, yeah, initiation to the natural world. And, you know, my, my dad actually, he passed away kind of suddenly when I was six years old. He actually he took his own life, and um, that after he died, you know, that kind of flipped my whole world upside down and really changed my family dynamics and everything. But if I could just get back to the ocean, I felt like that was my kind of home base. And you know, I I started to see 
sort of my dad in, in every aspect of that environment. And so that, it was kind of like my time to be back with my dad. And that stuck with me and has inspired me ever since to really, um, you know, spend a lot of time in nature. And I know it's a healing place for me. And then also really wanting to help other folks get outside, not just to the ocean, but, uh, you know, wherever that may be for them. Yeah, I think I, I also grew up on the beach. Um, you know, I live just a couple of blocks away from the ocean in, in Santa Cruz, which is, of course, one of the reasons it's a shame that I never surfed. Uh, mm-hmm. But I just grew up walking on the beach and having, you know, playing pretend and just stuff kids do, you know. And it was just a few blocks away. And my mom was like, OK, you know, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm down there pretending rock piles or pirate ships and living my best life, you know. Uh, in, in, in a fog bank because that's what Santa Cruz. Um, <laughs> and it, there is, there's that special connection and the way that the ocean is just so steady and also un, like somehow also unpredictable. It just, it, it's soothing. It soothes your soul just to know that that's consistent, you know? Absolutely. Just, yeah. Oh, I wish I was back there right now. Okay. But we are, we are, we are surfing right now. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. Don't forget. <laughs> I will not. Okay. So what is the what was the genesis for starting a company around unplugging? Yeah. So, you know, I kind of continuing on from my backstory, really um having this deep connection from a young age and then wanting to do some sort of work that was getting people outside. So I started I guess the the early um vision of Nature Unplugged was just getting people out on you know, unique, cool adventures, outdoor adventures around San Diego and Southern California and started doing that, uh, leading individuals and groups. Um, And what I noticed, especially when working with kids or young people, was how much of a challenge or how much of a pull screens and technology were to to getting outside and enjoying the outdoors. So really started to look at, you know, not just, yeah, it's awesome to get outside, but what's going on on the technology side? And that's when we kind of Sonia and I combined forces. She her background's more in, in education. And we looked at kind of dug into the research and really saw that rather well, like a, a very it's a very important from our perspective to kind of tackle both ends of it, getting people outside and also, you know, how to create healthy boundaries with technology. Not yeah. anti-tech, but just how to be more intentional with our technology. Yeah, and I'll and I'll add that um one of the things that became really eye-opening to us, because I think we talk about this often from the frame of like, wow, kids are so overexposed to screens today, is just noticing that we felt really overexposed right. <laughs> to screens. And it was really a challenge for us to find balance. And so a lot of it stemmed also from our personal journeys on how to have a healthy relationship with technology and then wanting to share what we had learned with others. And in, important note, I just want to add in that Sonia and I are, are married. So we, we had a you know relationship and in a business business partnership and life partnership. And so we you know we saw the, the impact of tech on our yeah, personal sure. relationship yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. So I was I was telling my husband about this podcast episode and, and how he's getting ready to record it and was um, preparing for it. And I told him, I joked that I felt like I was about to go to confessional and um, <laughs> confess all of my you know, screen laden bad habits, because I really do feel that way. Like, I feel like I'm a slave to this thing. So I want to know why is unplugging so darn hard? And why do I feel this like gravitational pull from my screens? What is up with that? Yeah. Well, don't feel bad about it. I think we all are, you know, experiencing the same thing you're experiencing. Um, So one of the pieces is don't feel shame and guilt because it's, it is it is really hard. And the reason why it's really hard, um, first off, is because technology's, technology just isn't neutral anymore today. Um, there are so many people behind the scenes, like developers, designers, et cetera, who are studying neuroscience and psychology, and they're learning basically how to undermine our willpower and keep us coming back to our devices mm-hmm. frequently and staying longer. Um, and so some easy um, to understand examples of this are like anything really that's gamifying our experience, um, like snap streaks. We're not really into um, Snapchat, but this is something that we're aware of where it becomes like almost a game for people to have um, the longest snap streak they can have, which is just, Mm -hmm. you know, sending a chat back and forth to each other every day for, you know, however long the streak is. Um, So it just keeps them coming back every day at least once to send a message to their friends. Um, and then things like autoplay, right? When we're watching Netflix or YouTube, um, 
you know, before the episode would just end and you had to make a really conscious decision to play the next episode. Right. Uh, and now it just, you get that little countdown timer. It's like five seconds uh, and the next episode just begins. And so you have to summon all of this willpower to stop. Uh, you know, even if that's what you sort of wanted to do, it doesn't really give you time to make conscious decisions around the technology we're using. Um, and sort of the larger term for that, what that sits under is this idea of the attention economy um, that instead of thinking about just like dollars as a currency in um, in our lives, attention is sort of a new currency. And the longer we spend on any site or platform, the basically the more opportunity advertisers have to <laughs> advertise to us or sell us something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really valuable to these platforms to keep us engaged as long as possible. Um, and so that's sort of working in the background too and has really changed the way we relate to our devices and our screens. I, I'm sort of chuckling. Uh, because I'm remembering back when, you know, before video streaming was a thing, maybe I'm sh showing my age here <laughs> a little bit, but that my friend had a five disc DVD player. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's insane. Can't you just get up and change the DVD? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot yeah. about that. Um, yeah. yeah that's the two for us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now we, you know, now I'm like, um, if the video is not going to start on its own on the Netflix, then probably not going to watch it. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Even just going into a video store and like picking out a movie. And then that's just the, you have that movie only. You can't like, then just go, I mean, right. I guess you could go back to the store, but a whole different world around intention really right. now. Right. So, um, the intentionality of, the choice to get up, go outside, or to uh, just to simply unplug. I mean, you don't even have to go outside to unplug, right? right. Uh, is completely counter to the, you know, to that attention economy um, factor we're talking about where I don't have to do anything. It's just passive, that things just start for me. And now I don't have to summon anything whatsoever to comp continue to participate. Yeah, that's absolutely it. Yeah. And I'll just add, you know, you may have seen this or maybe some of your listeners. Uh, if you want to do a deeper dive into this, the, there's a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, which... Ironically. Pretty, <laughs> Ironically. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Check out this on Netflix. Um, <laughs> but it does a really good job. It goes pretty deep, so it gets kind of extreme. But it does a really good job of detailing, hmm. you know, really how much how many resources and how much money goes into, you know, plotting how to keep us on our devices for as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think all, I mean, you said earlier, you're not um, totally anti-screens. So I, I know that that, that maybe this is a bit of a dramatic question, but is all screen time the great Satan? Uh, and yeah. should we be drastic and ruthless in our elimination of it? That's a really good question. And you know, our perspective on this is that no, it's not. It's not all bad. You know, um, and again, you know, we're not anti-tech. We we don't live like in a yurt on a mountaintop in the middle of nowhere, completely unplugged. We we love aspects of technology and aspects of Netflix, and and I think even from like an adventure perspective, okay. things like GPS and all trails or different apps that can enhance nature time are really wonderful and. Um, you know, it just goes back to really being intentional and, uh, you know, finding what works for you. I think the other thing is that if you happen to have, you know, a specific day or time that you are on a ton of, you uh, have a lot of screen time, that needs to be counterbalanced with, you know, a similar amount of nature time, in our opinion. Yeah, I, I feel like one one thing that's also helpful or another way to think about it um, is in terms of like food and nutrition. Um where you wouldn't just sit around eating um, candy bars all day or having just constant sugar, um, you'd want to balance that with something more nutritious. And the idea that you know screen time is a is often a treat, and so just being aware of like how you're spending your screen time and, and the value it's bringing, and then like Sebastian said, countering it with something um, that's more meaningful um, for you or produces something more valuable for you. So it's like trying to avoid this cyber snacking, if you will. 
Yeah. I, I, um, I like that analogy. I'm envisioning my kid. I have an 11 year old son and we really, really babysit how much screen time they're allowed to have. Um, we use it as a, as a reward tool and we dole it out as 20 minutes. You know, if you do all of your schoolwork and have, you know, great feedback from your teachers today, your reward is 20 minutes and I will let you look over your brother's shoulder for his 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, so that's, I mean, that's a cap of 40 minutes of screen time a day plus whatever they're doing at school. Right. Yeah. Um, but we're not sitting around watching TV or whatever, but the way that this, these kids are motivated by that 40 minutes. Um, and it's, it's an, it's almost like watching somebody, try to figure out a way to get the thing that's making, you know, their addiction or how I feel about coffee, you know? Yeah. Like, um, and when I withhold that from him, uh, he will do pretty much anything to get it back. <laughs> and, um, you know, so this isn't somebody who's like working on some sort of mega Minecraft world for hours and hours and hours on end and super invested in that. I mean, we're talking about however much, many games you can play in 20 minutes, that's what you get. Yeah. Um, and so I just like, that's fascinating to me that it has that kind of a hold over his brain. And I see it in myself too, right? You know, I'm here mindlessly sc scrolling, whatever it is I'm scrolling. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes back to this, the idea of the attention economy. And basically we're getting hits of dopamine by mm -hmm. playing these games, et cetera. And so it's creating this reward system that, um, you know, our whole, our whole day is geared towards how can we get that dopamine hit again? Yeah. That's that's interesting. So I want to get really, really practical here mm -hmm. uh, in a few minutes and talk about how we can, how I can. I'm gonna be really selfish today, guys. Like I I help me. So <laughs> help me unplug. Um, so to first talk to us about what do you consider an acceptable balance? You know, I'm like I said, I'm giving my kids 20 minutes at a time. Uh is that a balance? What what does balance look like? Sure. It's it's a challenging question to answer because it's not really a one size fits all, right? There's so many sure. variables that come into play. Age uh, is one of them for sure. And your basically your development, have you developed impulse control, et cetera. But also, right, there's this idea of, um, you know, some people, especially right now, um, have to be totally working remotely and sort of on their computers all day for a nine to five, either for, for work or for school. Um, and so, really the way we look at it and we, we try not to be too prescriptive is just the more screen time you have in your life in your day by because of you know whatever reason the more green time you really should try to insert in your day to balance it out hey humans just a quick break to tell you how you can support the humans outside podcast did you know we're on patreon Patreon allows fans like you to support the podcast through a monthly pledge. By pledging a little cash each month to support the Humans Outside podcast, you can have access to my bonus features, guides, discount codes, and an exclusive episode on, you know what, actually, just go check it out. You'll also get my eternal gratitude, of course. Check us out on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash humans outside. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash humans outside. Now, back to the show. I joked with you when we were chatting over email that my only unplugging tips are really like how we're surfing to quote unquote together right now to be somewhere that you cannot have your screen. So with no cell signal or it's too cold or I'm afraid of dropping it because I'm in a ski lift. Um, I can't, I mean, all of those things sound great, right? Like mm -hmm. let's do those all the time, but alas, we cannot do that. I cannot just spend my life doing those things. And then I create excuses for myself like, oh, I'm going to go outside and I'm not going to use my phone, but I am going to take all these pictures. Oh, oh snap. My phone is my camera, you know, and yeah. now I'm like suddenly into some sort of vortex where I'm posting them on Instagram and now I'm not just taking pictures and, you know, so on and so forth. So what is the secret to learning some unplugging self-control? Because that's really what we're talking about here. Self-control. Yeah, no, that's a super good question. And again, I, I, I want to say that there's, you know, there, I don't think there's really a particular secret or like hack to like, here's the one thing you got to do to change your world with, you know, technology, <laughs> but it really comes down to like intentionality and persistence and holding those boundaries. Um, 
you know, and, and I want to get into more specifics of what we mean by that in, a, in yeah. a little bit, but I also want to share that, you know, over the course of the, you know, we've been doing this since 2012 and we do you know, coaching work with one-on-one -on -one clients, we do workshops and we've, we've worked with a lot of people, a lot of young people and adults as well. And we've, over the course of that time have developed a bit of a method and mm -hmm. that's a, kind of a five part method that we work with people on. And I won't go into too much detail on this, but we detail on this, but we really start with, you know, reframing how we think about technology and digital media. And that comes with like some basic education of what if that technology isn't neutral and, and understanding the attention economy, because without knowing what's going on in the back end, it's really uh, kind of hard to deal with it and to counterbalance it. And then I think I want to get into this further, but we, you know, the, the real first step is what we call reset. And that's, you know, how to create a new relationship with technology and with nature. Uh, and we have a few steps to that that I'll, sh uh, that I'll share in a few minutes. Um, we also, you know, step three would be all around reconnecting. So that's like how to, how to connect with our bodies through movement and how to connect with others through relationship building. Um, and then we do, you know, deeper work through our fourth step, which is all about rewiring. That's kind of like doing the inner work of getting in touch with our values and aligning with our values. Um, and then really harnessing the power of play and creativity and kind of like, because it's not just about creating the boundaries, but it's about, in our opinion, how to, you know, engage in life in a new way, in a different way. Because if you're, just, if you're creating these boundaries around tech and then don't have a plan for what to do, mm. um, chances are you're going to slide back into, you know, whatever patterns you were before. So it's like, you know, what do you really love? And that, you know, that could be outdoor time or it could be something different, but having something to engage in is key. Yeah. The, the, um, the replacement activity, right? right? That's, it's important to know what you're going to do potentially if you have this void, um, after you stop doing X, Y, Z with your screen or device. Um, so sometimes it does really take a bit of time to like explore things or reconnect to the things that really bring you joy so that you can look forward um, to the non-screen time moments in your day. Right. So I, I think it's, um, it's interesting because what you're talking about is like in that um, replacement is just a fundamental of good habit building, right? Mm -hmm. In the first episode of this season three of the Humans Outside podcast, we heard from a habit expert who talked a little bit about this and about the idea that if you're going to take something out of, if you're going to remove something, you need to replace it with something. And that goes for unplugging, that goes for, you know, changing your habits. So talk us through those things. And, and I want to um, note, I think you guys are working on a workbook on this, right? That, that people can access at some point. Yes, actually, we have a book book, just a, normal, a, a book that overviews this kind of our methodology and the research behind it in detail, which we're very excited about, which is called Experience Nature Unplugged. And it's a guide to wellness in the digital age. And that comes out March 1st, 2021. Wow. So we will definitely keep you posted. And there's going to be a work complimentary workbook that goes along with that. Okay. All right. Well, that is uh, just about the time that people will be hearing this. So that's perfect timing. Cool. There yeah. we go. Yeah. So awesome. So we will, uh, everyone will include a link to that book book and complimentary workbook in the show notes as well. But um, walk us through, uh, walk us through what you're going to, what you're going to detail there. So people get a little taste of it and, and talk us through these, these steps that you just um, described a few minutes ago. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, so, so basically the, the method more or less that Sebastian outlined earlier, um, is the skeleton for the book. Um, yeah. so it gives a good blend of sort of research context of what's happening with screen time. And then it goes into what the benefits of nature are, like why, why we should care about getting outside and all the great things it does for us. Yeah. Um, but what we really tried to do with the book is create sort of a practical system, some tangible steps and tips. So as much as we say, like, you know, there's no silver bullet or there's no hack, we do like to provide, you know, a bunch of things that people can try that help them reset or help them, you know, get moving in the right direction. And then it's a sort of a trial and error process. Um, so in particular, maybe it would be useful to share some of the like steps to reset yeah. technology and some of our favorite ones there. Yeah, that'd be great. And of course, we don't want you to give away the farm, uh, nor could you in, uh, in a short little podcast. But um, I mean, I, I think we're all eager to hear 
to hear some tips. I know I am again, sorry guys, selfish questions today. No <laughs> Help me. <laughs> what should yeah. I do? <laughs> Great question. So I want to share four of our just favorite, you know, pretty practical and simple tips to get this going with reset. This is all about resetting your tech uh, mm. habits. Okay. So step one is finding a home for your phone. And I'll, I'll explain what all these things are, but that, that one's sort of self-explanatory, but um, just, you know, take what works for you, leave what doesn't work. Uh, but basically this is a place like a charging station, a basket when you come in your living room, some place where your phone basically lives while you're at home. And the idea here, this may sound a little extreme, is to kind of treat your, your smartphone as if it was a landline or use it like in very intentionally in one area. So it's not just with you 24 seven. Mm. So not with you in the bathroom, with mm -hmm. you in the bedroom or where, you know, wherever you may find yourself, but having a place where your phone lives. And then when you need to use it, let's say you need to go call or text or, you know, check out social media, you intentionally go to that area and use it. So that's one. Second one is getting your tech out of the bedroom. Mm. And um, again, not I, we totally understand that not everyone can do this completely, but this was a huge, huge, uh, you know, hugely benefited us in our relationship where we kind of fell into this habit of, you know, our phones were our alarm clocks and um, we didn't intentionally make this, but, you know, every night before bed, we just, you know, I would be on social media or reading news on our phones or whatever. And that was kind of how we ended our day. And then the alarm would go off in the morning, we'd have notifications. And then all of a sudden, that was the unintentional beginning of our day of just spending time on, on devices. So we, you know, we, we basically for us, we created a charging station in our living room. And that's where now our phones mainly live. And at night, that's where they go. And, uh, you know, then we have kind of a, a tech free space in the bedroom. And we got a really cool analog alarm clock. It's like a sunrise one. So Ooh. it brightens up the room like the sun because we also have blackout curtains. So we don't get the actual sun waking us up. But um, I, that actually tends to be one of the biggest obstacles when people think about getting technology out of the bedroom is, well, I use you know my smartphone as my alarm. And the <laughs> simple solution, right, is to just go back to a analog alarm clock. Um, and fortunately, alarm clocks are really cool now. Yeah, yeah. Lots, of lots of options. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, so that's two. So finding your home for your phone, getting tech out of the bedroom. And then we have, uh, this is one of my favorites, is creating a digital curfew. Okay. So this is, you know, I think a time where your device or devices, they go to bed. Uh, and ideally, this is an hour, at least an hour, maybe two hours before you go to bed. So let's say you go to bed at 10, maybe digital curfew is 8 p.m. or 8.30, something like that. And then also, I think this, I think that's kind of a common practice, but what we really love too is having a, a morning sort of wake up time where we have like bookended our day with some unplugged time. So there's an evening routine that's more analog and unplugged and then a morning routine. What, you know, regardless, maybe that's making coffee or doing some stretches or reading a book or whatever, or going for a walk that is unplugged time at the beginning of the day as well. Mm -hmm. And then I think... This is just a huge one to um, create some like a habit of unplugging daily. We really recommend 60 minutes unplug time uh, every day. And that can be time in nature. That can be time, you know, learning to play the guitar, doing having a time to, to practice your new um, sort of activity that you're going to do instead of unplugging. Is that consecutive or accumulative? Just cumulative. It can be, you know, 10 minutes at different points in the day, but just finding 60 minutes total within the day um, to get outside. We know that you've got a good routine, right? Of yeah. 20 minutes every day. That's great. I mean, yeah, but, but, but I take my phone with me outside. So mm. I, yeah, because so my thing, so when I first started doing my 20 minutes a day, I like rules as I'm sure you could tell. And <laughs> cause I just asked, like, tell me the rules. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I decided that it would not be practical for me to go without my phone. Uh, mm -hmm. I also decided that I wanted to log my daily time somehow and that I would never in a million years get around to journaling it. So mm -hmm. I, cause once I walked in the door, I'd be like, well, that, you know, we've moved on. Um, so instead I would take a picture every day. And so that, um, results in, like I confessed earlier, my phone coming with me in the winter time 
time, I will say that I do not look at my phone while I'm outside um, because I take my picture and my hands are cold and I put that sucker away. Um, Mm -hmm. Mittens prohibit screen use. These things, people that say you can use your mittens and your phone at the same time are lying. That's all a bunch of lies. Okay. So (laughs) that's never worked for me. Uh, So uh, in the summertime, though, I inevitably spiral into some sort of a of a screen time. And I, some of our listeners may remember me talking in the past about looking at my phone while walking and almost walking into a moose because I was like texting (laughs) while I walked. I mean, those are Alaska problems, but real life guys. So, (laughs) so uh, I am um, going to challenge our listeners to join me actually on a, because I'm a baby steps kind of person too, uh, just seven days challenge in conjunction with this podcast. Um, and I've got a printable on my website, humansoutside.com for, for folks who um, sign up for the newsletter, you'll be met, emailed a link to that. And we'll include the link in the show notes for this. But if you already sign up for the newsletter, uh, take a look at your most recent one, there will be a link in it to the printable. But uh, join me in a little challenge, seven days of going outside for your 20 minutes or whatever it is you're doing. Leave that phone and your screens behind. And if you like me, take a photo at the end, take a photo or take a photo during the event, take a photo at the end instead when you're done. Um, So those are going to be seven days of very boring photos of me just being like, I'm done now. Um, But (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, that'll be, that's what it is. And we're going to see if, if I can do it, you know, if I can make an, and well, I know I can do it right. Anyone can do that. But um, what, what will be even more interesting is what I notice or the impacts of that, of that is, um, and to see, you know, how my experience for those 20 minutes changes or more, you know, depends on the day, changes as a result of not being distracted at all by my technology because it is not with me at all. Yeah, I love that. I love all the things, the challenge, and I'm really interested to hear how it goes for you. So definitely keep us posted. And, and um, but I think it's a huge thing and it's it's challenging, certainly, but I, I, I do think that when you can do it, you know, when it, when it makes sense and when it's safe to leave your phone behind, um, it definitely, or at least for me personally, it changed, it completely changes my, my attention, my, I guess my ability to stay present and all that, all those things. And it's a completely different experience and it's quite amazing. Yeah. Well, we, so you, when you outlined your steps, we talked a lot about things that can be done both inside and outside. I mean, but, but a lot of what you described are really habits for your everyday life indoors um, in a lot of ways. So I'm really wondering though, if there's some secret magic to unplugging outside versus inside that you get a benefit to doing that in nature in a way that you wouldn't to developing that habit just in your everyday indoor life, learning the guitar or whatever it is you do with that unplug time. Yeah, it's sort of a good, better, best model, um, right? Because it's unplugging just in general is great. And then if you can unplug and be outside, that's even better. Uh, And mostly because, as Sebastian mentioned before, it totally engages our senses in a different way. Um, And uh, there's so much research now on the benefits of spending time outside. And so basically, even if it's an activity you can do inside, if you can do it outside, you get all these great um, benefits like increased cognitive functioning, focus and creativity. It boosts your, your mood and your positive emotions, right? Like that's just five minutes outside does that reduces our stress and our anger and often, you know, aggressive sort of behaviors. Uh, and that can happen after just 15 minutes outside. And then there's all the like great physical benefits of promoting healthy eye development, um, reducing risk of, you know, things like obesity, diabetes, um, hypertension, things that come from more sedentary lifestyles, which, you know, we tend to sit more when we're engaged with our devices and indoors. Um, and then just being outside also really promotes moving around. Like I noticed that it's harder to just sit still when I'm outside. And so then you get benefits, you know, like stability, posture, blood circulation, that sort of stuff too. Um, and one of the things that we have found so fascinating in doing some of the research for our book was that Um, A lot of these studies are now really aimed to like doses of nature, like how much time do you need to spend outside to get some of these benefits? Um, 
And it's really cool to see, and it's really practical to see because I think it feels sort of abstract or unattainable. But then when you start seeing these like, oh, five minutes does this and 15 minutes does this, it's like, oh, I can, I can do that. That's not too bad, um, which, is, which is really cool. Uh, and again, sort of this natural counterbalance or antidote. It's just um, being outside tends to promote being off screens um, and it in ways minimizes like the temptation, right, for getting on a device or screen or sort of the unconscious habits that we have indoors and um, allows us the space to sort of find our replacement activities. And like we said before, those are the those are the key. Right. right? And because it just dis- what we also said before, it disrupts that just, you know, habitual restarting of the video, if you will, right? Because you're yeah. in a new place, new, you know, new perspective. Um, and uh, and if you're on your device, you might walk into a moose. Who can yeah. say? <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Right. I love that example. That's great. You have That's, that experience. That's amazing. Well, and moose don't like it when you run into them, by the way. Not a fan. <laughs> They're but. so big. It's actually very impressive you almost ran into a moose. So we talked about unplugging inside. We've talked about the value of unplugging outside. Can you give us, uh, sort of marry those two things, give us some actionable tips for unplugging outside? Um, and if other people are still thinking, but what about taking pictures? Do you have any advice for having the self-control to both capture your adorable child or pet but not then spiral into the <laughs> zone. <laughs> yeah, it's challenging. I mean, we feel the phone piece a lot for your for your camera as well, because right now, I mean, gosh, phones have like just such the best <laughs> cameras on them. Um, I think there are some some basic ways to do that with like um, putting on do not disturb when you go for your walk so that you're not, you know, pulled in or seeing a bunch of notifications. Um, and then, I mean, you can sort of clear your icons off of your, what we call the desktop of your phone um, so that they're all sort of out of sight. So that again, when you pull it up to use your camera, you don't get, you know, sidetracked into a vortex of notifications. Um, But then also, I mean, I think one of the ways we talk about spending more time outside and unplugging is this idea of bringing the um, inside outside. So really identifying the things that, you know, we do inside that we could very, easily do outside, you know, whether that's reading or, um, you know, listening to a podcast even, I mean, I guess that's plugged in, but, um, I, it's like journaling, drawing, like just anything you can do inside, um, finding a way to do it outside. Mm-hmm. Oh, those are such good tips. I, how come that never occurred to me to like put my phone on, do not disturb or hide my icons. So simple. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my mind is blown. You guys are awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for that. I, I love it. I'm going to try those things literally today, um, and, uh, see how it, how it goes. And then of course, when we do our little seven days, I will report back. Did I die? Probably. Not. <laughs> and, and, uh, if you want to go, if you want to be a little bit more hardcore airplane mode is also mm-hmm. a good I know, guys, uh, airplane, good, mode. That's yeah. like a bridge, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can handle that. All right, but we'll yeah. try it. We'll try it all. Um, and uh, man, such such good advice. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, we've gotten to be part of our show where we just do some leftovers, just stuff I like to know from everybody. So, um, you know, I'm I'm really curious to hear your favorites. Can you guys uh, both tell me your favorite outdoor gear and your most essential outdoor gear? Which, by the way, are sometimes the same things, but other times not so much. So you tell me. Yeah, that's a fun question. Um, I would say they're they're definitely not the same thing for me. Um, my favorite outdoor gear item is um, the AeroPress. Mm. I, you into that? Have you heard of that? Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. It's like a little tiny French press sort of coffee thing. I mean, sometimes after we go camping and we haven't fully put it away, we just use that to make our coffee because it's so fun and novel. Um, and easy to clean, which is a big deal when it comes to coffee and outdoor time. Um, but I would say my most essential outdoor gear item is actually a bandana. Um, I don't know what it is. I can't, I hadn't, I haven't quite gotten on the buff train. I like buffs. They're very functional, but I just feel like the versatility of a bandana is so epic that, um, I tend to just always have those and use it instead of a buff, but you know, it's, can cover your nose and mouth. It can, 
you know, be paper towel, it can be toilet paper, um, and it sanitizes itself really well. You can, you know, in a in a bind, I think uh, you can use it, you know, to make some coffee if you forgot a filter in AeroPress even. Probably not after you've also used it for the other things you just Yeah, said. you would have multiple bandanas probably. <laughs> What about you? Coffee first. Coffee first. Yeah. Coffee first. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sebastian? Oh, yeah. It's a great question. I love the question. I'm going to go with, since we're out surfing right now, I have a, this is probably not an Alaska thing, but more of a Southern California thing. I have a, a actually like a surf hat. It's like a sun hat that I can wear while I'm surfing that I love that I wear all the time when I'm surfing in San Diego. And I also just wear it when I'm like hiking and stuff too. So it's got like pretty good coverage. It's got a little like buckle on the bottom and a little like back flap for my neck. There's a, yeah, it's, it's, I kind of bring it everywhere I go. Um, and then my, that's, that's, that's my favorite. My essential outdoor gear item is probably, I'm going to go with my Nalgene. It's yeah. just, I love water. <laughs> um, hydration is huge. I've got, I'm looking at my Nalgene right now and I have a sticker from Joshua Tree National Park. It says, uh, don't die today. And there's a picture of a uh, you know, great horned sheep skeleton uh, skull. But water's key, you know, um, yeah. especially in Southern California and deserty environments. And then there's all sorts of cool things you can do with it. You know, like um, let's say you don't have a campfire, you can strap your headlamp to the Nalgene with water in it, and it becomes this sort of like cool uh, camp, you know, campfire light type thing. You could put hot water in it before you go to bed on a cold night and it's your little like warm buddy in the sleeping bag. <laughs> so super versatile and I like water. Yeah, I, I love my water bottles. I use a, a hydro flask, uh, but big fan of the Nalgene as well. Um, and uh, it's a, I like to put my bragging stickers on it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. My like things that I've done that I'm proud of or enjoyed or just want to remember. And then I have a separate one for uh, just for running. Cause I'm a, I'm a runner. Um, mm. so my little, my running, actually that was a coffee mug. Uh, yeah. So I, I hear that. I hear that. And, uh, we'll be sending you, we send our, um, our guests as a thank you humans outside decals. So you'll be getting those yeah. in the mail. Uh, but maybe, you know, consider slapping one of those bad boys on a water bottle. I like yeah. uh, mine on the, uh, we have a rocket box in my car. That's where my other place. <laughs> I apparently have a lot of stickers now that I'm talking about it. I don't know yeah. what's going on over here. <laughs> I haven't met I haven't met a sticker I didn't like, so I'm excited to get it. So the end of our show, we'd love to hear uh, our listeners' favorite outdoor moment, just to like set, you know walk us out and leave us with a with an awesome visualization. So um, I don't know if you have each have one uh, and you want to give us two, but if you would describe to us your favorite outdoor moment, just like that happy place you close your eyes and picture the best thing ever. Where are you and what are you doing? Hmm. We'll, we'll share sort of, um, a joint one. Um, it may be a little cheesy, so forgive us, but, um, there is a park near where we live called San Diego County park. Uh, and it's a really incredible park cause it has this lower park space. That's got beautiful green grass and these huge, lovely trees, lots that are great to climb on. And all of these little, sort of nooks that you can go get some privacy and space in. Um, and the grass and sort of really leafy trees is a treat in San Diego because we're sort of in a deserty area. But um, the upper park has like some great trail systems some fun play stuff, et cetera. But one of these little inlets on the lower part of the park has like a whole bunch of clovers. And I'd noticed them before. Um, and this is a, a park that Sebastian really loved growing up. And so he took me there and, you know, it was about the time we were starting to talk about getting married. And he was like, you know what, like, why don't we sit in this clover field um, and look for a four leaf clover? And if we find one, um, let's just decide to get married. <laughs> and so I didn't really, I was like, that's sweet. Great. Let's go look for it. And um, didn't really think much about it. And we sat down and really within, I would say five minutes, ended up finding multiple four leaf clovers. <laughs> and the cute part about it was, I guess Sebastian had known that this little patch existed uh, in the grassy area. So it was a little bit of a, a plan, but it was very sweet. Um, and it is this really just beautiful, naturey, woodsy feeling space in the middle of San Diego. Um, we were just sitting there smiling, taking, you know, some time with each other about finding this four leaf clover. And it was a, a special moment in a special park. And every time we go, we love it. Sebastian, did you know you were going to find a four leaf clover that day? 
Yeah, I had kind of a four leaf clover uh, scouting mission prior to this <laughs> this uh, park mission. Uh, but yeah, there's, it was weird. It was this. I don't know if it's still going on, but there was this one area where I just there was I don't know a bunch of four leaf clovers. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Yeah, it's I still think there. It's a fun place to take kids because they never think they're going to find them, and more often we do. That's great. I love it. Great story, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on Humans Outside today. Boy, do I appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. Thanks for having us on. That's it for this week's episode of the Humans Outside podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, give us a little love and leave a rating and review to make it easier for others to find the podcast too. And by supporting us on Patreon, you get access to exclusive supporter-only benefits while making sure we can keep the podcast going. A huge, huge thank you to our current supporters. Until next time, we'll see you out there. <laughs>